Today's topic is very exciting. It is uh, parking reform and its impacts on, you know, people who are aging, people with disabilities, mobility issues. And I think um, this is something that if you've worked in this space, uh, it's or many housing and transportation if, um, reform, you know, advocacy spaces, um, this is a topic that that is commonly brought up. And I think we can um, have great discussion of, and, and figure out what these impacts are and what mitigations are possible and, and how we can be sensitive and, and inclusive in um, promoting these reforms. So um, I'm going to pin a number of folks on here, our special guests, and then and I'll uh, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Cassie Wilson. I use she, her pronouns. Not representing an organization today, but I'm a climate, transportation, and disability justice organizer. I live in Boring, Oregon, which is about 20 miles east of Portland. I have a mobility-related disability, but I'm able to drive, which in my case is very good because there are no alternatives to getting around here besides driving. Um... I am a liberal studies student at Portland State University, and I'm taking a bunch of urban planning classes. Um, and yeah, majority of the time when I travel to Portland for school or meetings, um, I drive to a park and ride so that way I can take transit most of the way. The main exception is when I'm taking my mom to her doctor's appointments. Um, so I also have that perspective of more door-to-door uh, -door transportation accessibility needs. Thank you. My name is Megan Lynch. I uh... I am the founder of UC Access Now, which is a loose coalition of students, staff, and faculty throughout the University of California system. Uh, we are working to dismantle uh, ableism throughout the system, not just the campuses. And uh, our focus, as opposed to a lot of previous disability organizations within UC, uh, is much broader. It's not just about you know, making sure that you have accessible classes. It's really to make sure everything's accessible, and that extends to infra infrastructure, uh, which would include, for instance, cycle infrastructure or making it easier to uh, have accessible um, uh, transportation and pub trams around the university. Um, so uh, thanks. I'm happy to be here today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna V. Uh, she, her pronouns. I am based in the Seattle area, Washington State. I direct the Disability Mobility Initiative, which is a program within Disability Rights Washington that organizes non-drivers. And um, we sort of organize across people who identify as disabled, like uh, myself, people who can't drive because of our disabilities. I'm low vision. Uh, also, people who don't necessarily identify as disabled, but have other reasons they can't drive or don't have a reliable access to a vehicle, whether that be income, uh, uh, you know, not being able to afford a vehicle, uh, not having a valid, valid documentation, that driver's license, not knowing how to drive, uh, having anxiety around driving, lots of reasons out there. And so that's the work we do. Um, and we do not explicitly have a, a parking policy. Uh, around a parking reform, but I'm uh, very interested to be part of this conversation. I think much of the work we do is focused around questioning communities that are built around driving, because for those of us who can't drive, there's a lot of barriers uh, that we see are only able to be addressed through rethinking auto dependence. So that's us. Hi, thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Cora Hannon. I work in AARP's Department of Government Affairs. And if for those of you who may not be familiar, AARP is an organization that represents the interests of um, folks that are age 50 plus. And I work in the livable community space in government affairs. And basically the issues on my team are housing, transportation, broadband, and energy advocacy. Um, AARP does have policy with respect to parking reform related issues. Uh, we believe that there should be um, communities should be constructed and preserved in favor of housing and making them livable for the folks who live there and thereby minimizing parking that's unnecessary. Um, we do have a policy book. Um, if you, I, I'll put the link in the chat when I get a chance, but if you want to take a closer look at the policy, I don't want to read it um, while we're here, but we do have policy in this space. 
The other thing I wanted to highlight is that I'm in government affairs and we have two other departments that also um, engage in either research or creating public facing resources related to parking and other transportation and livable community issues. Those are our public policy institute and also our programs team. And I, there are two publications I'm going to put in the chat from those two teams related to parking that you all might be interested in. Um, so I'm happy to be here today and um, representing AARP on this issue and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's start out. I've met with um, each of these, um, I guess, panelists um, individually. And, and so we have had some discussions about what, what exactly Parking Uniform Network does and what these policies are. And um, so have you heard uh, arguments for or against parking reform that, that you feel are, um, you know, uh, like in, in, in the arguments you've heard for or against parking reforms, including my discussions with you, which do you find compelling? Do you find any capricious or not very compelling? Like, what do you think are the um, like, what's your kind of basic read on parking policy reform? OK, uh, I'll mention something that you you said during the conversation we had, which is, I think, literally the first time I've heard this. What I what I'm used to and I would assume uh, other disabled people here are used to in this space is uh, within both car centrum, car centrism and new urbanism, there's ableism on either side because we live in an ableist society. It's not something that, you know, one political bent has a monopoly on. And because of that, the conversations that I witness and participate in sometimes in Twitter and whatnot uh, kind of use disabled people just as a cudgel, which is the car centrists will leap in and they'll say, we can't do this because disabled people need this. And then people on the other side will say, not everybody can afford a car. Disabled people make less money, which is often true. Uh, and, you know, but we're not really talking to actual disabled people. And one of the things you mentioned that that, that I don't think I've ever heard anybody mention who uh, on either side of it was, well, if disabled people, you know, um, need the parking spaces, certain disabled people really have a great need of disabled parking spaces. Let's just, you know, make fewer parking spaces, but make more of them disabled parking spaces. <laughs> and I just wanted to mention that because it's like, it's a very novel suggestion that I've never heard anybody make before. I was also going to comment that, yeah, literally whenever I see conversations for or against really anything in the world of transportation, yeah, it's always, it, it's very often a bunch of non-disabled people claiming what is or isn't ableist on either side. Um, and I think in reality, a lot of it is just, yeah, a lot more nuanced than people want it to be. Um, and a lot of times disabled people just aren't run to conversation. So thank you for this round table. Um, I think, um, I mean, like, to me, the most compelling reasons for parking reform is just like, it's easier to build more densely. It's easier to build affordable housing, prevent further sprawl, reduce reliance on cars, like all good things. I think at least locally, a lot of the arguments I've heard from like elected officials who are actually the ones, you know, voting on it. Uh, <laughs> They're like, it's always like in context of like affordable housing or like specific, you know, zones that are right next to transit. And they're always just like, I can't fathom getting around without, you know, 10 cars. I'm just like, oh, it's just like, it just makes me roll my eyes because I'm just like, it's, it's fascinating how much car dependence and just car dominance in society has made it so people can't people in power can't fathom that people get around differently than them or can't afford to um own a bunch of cars or um just choose to not get around with one if they live right next to transit um yeah but i haven't i don't know i i mean like i, I think too a lot of people just miss that like, for example, like with parking mandates, like eliminating parking mandates, like doesn't mean that parking's not going to be built. And I think a lot of people miss that. That's a very good point. The thing that I would just mention is sometimes I feel like some people may think older adults may fall into the same category or may have the same feeling about the parking reform issue. And that's not always the case. There was an issue that came up in Maryland, for instance, where our state office was in support of removing certain parking requirements at a, I think it was more of a um, 
a shopping area where folks, there were a lot of folks on, on foot and there was a call for reducing parking. And then we had a member actually reach out and say that, no, she didn't agree with the position we were taking because when she, her daughter needs to drop her off, at places at near in this shopping center that she needs to be able to get out in front of the building and be able to have her daughter park in front of the building. So it's easier for her to get in and out because she cannot walk long distances um, without needing to take a rest. So I think we, we need to remember not to look, not to think that everyone who falls into a certain group is going to have the same position on an issue. We really need to look at the nuances and the personal experiences that folks may be bringing to the table, which may color the position that they're taking. Uh, this is Anna, and I can jump in with, I think this is all just, yeah, a really great and interesting conversation because I think it is, as Kathy was saying, nuanced. And like, yeah, I was saying lots of different, different sort of experiences. A lot of the work we do is you know, surveying and interviewing and then um, organizing non-drivers. And I think, so that's sort of, where I, I gain a lot of knowledge from people with different experiences than my own, um, which is very specific. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I moved to Seattle. I had grown up in this region, and then I lived in New York City for a long time. And, you know, as, as in New York City, such a large percentage of people don't own vehicles or have access to vehicles. And the existence of free street parking is... Uh, it's interesting, and it's something that a lot of transportation advocates there push back against. I remember, you know, the sort of chaos when alternate site parking um, would happen and the street cleaning and, and cars would be double parked waiting for the street cleaning to go by, the street cleaning, you know, machines, and then they would go back to their parking spot. And it was just, you know, such such limited space and such, um, it, it, and often like it, sort of a zero-sum game against the 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 space for people walking or rolling um, or, or biking. Living in other parts of the country, I think it's a different conversation. It's really interesting. Uh, in Seattle, where I live now, I live on a street that has free street parking. It's a neighborhood street on both sides of the street. And because of that, it has become a de facto one-way street. And so it actually acts to calm traffic. And so even, uh, you know, coming from New York, I would have been someone who was like, okay, we need to reduce the amount of street parking. Here in Seattle, the free street parking is what keeps my street uh, to be safe for people walking and rolling because the speeds are so limited because cars, um, when two cars come on, you know, on you know, see each other coming head on, one has to yield and sort of pull off into a parking spot for the other car to pass. And so it... Um, and that's the case on on many streets here in Seattle. And, um, you know, at, and so, you know, the practical piece of if you were to suddenly uh, reduce that amount of on street parking, it would it would make, I think, a lot higher speeds on the streets um, and, and where there are streets where there aren't sidewalks. And so cars can sort of pull to the side more and park out of the, the main part of the street. You do see much higher speeds because cars can, can pass each other. So just throwing that out there to to complicate things a little bit um the other the other thing i want to touch on is yeah the the, the sort of um what it feels like as someone who can drive to try to navigate these landscapes that are so dominated by big surface parking lots and that's um you know often because of sort of our tax structures and and also parking requirements but um how how difficult it can be to get to the front of a store um, when that that distance is much longer because of these giant giant surface parking lots and, and so much of the country, and so um, that is something that I think we we should be talking about because it it does um, become uh, you know a greater distance to cross, perhaps an unsafe distance, and also just um, makes people feel like the only uh, reasonable way to get to a location is driving uh, because the pedestrian environment is so hostile. That's Fantastic. And I think, you know, I, 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 you know, just, I'm going to say, uh, paid on street parking can provide traffic calming just as well as unpaid as free on street parking. <laughs> and, and, and the idea of how much we should remove on street parking is one that definitely comes up in the parking reform world. My personal, and I think our organizational's approach to this is if there's a better use for on street parking, like a bike lane or a bus lane or a wider sidewalk or maybe even street seating. Something else that takes that place, um, you know, it's 
it's worth it to replace it. And in my opinion, you know, much on street parking does provide access, especially if it is managed so people don't have to circle around to get into it. So um, I think that's not in conflict necessarily. Like, you know, just making our streets wider probably isn't going to um, <laughs> make things safer or better for us. I also think it's really interesting. Uh, a theme here is the, the things that provide mobility to some people may reduce the mobility for other people, like the 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 service lot mentioned for the um, grocery store or for the for the shopping center um, does provide easier access for someone who has someone to drive them. But then for someone getting off the bus is quite a large barrier to the store. Um, but I so I think that's a theme here is kind of like, you know, how are we how do we trade off? How do we um, what are the pros and cons here? Um, I, I I'm. Thinking about this, that most of the reforms are future looking, right? Like we're not, mostly we're not, you know, no, cities don't require existing parking to necessarily be, there may be policies that can encourage right. surface lots or redevelopment, but most of the time these requirements are for future development. So thinking about future development and in the, in, in mind that the vast majority of most of our infrastructure is currently built to accommodate cars primarily. How important do we think that new car parking is to accessibility for people with mobility issues? Like, you know, does every, you know, uh, and this, you know, on street, you know, like, like, does, does, is it important for, given that there are so many shopping centers that are completely car dominant, you know, for, is it, is it okay to build shopping centers or to build, build development that, that, um, that may be harder to get to by car, given that the, you know, majority of our options are, are car centric. I think it's really context dependent. And, uh, you know, you were saying uh, and other people have pointed out that there are, uh, you know, that it's a complex issue. And it's one of the reasons why um, I think it's important that. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, our society, every communication should be accessible, to, but especially in the transit space, you know, uh, I was just having to point this out this morning as I saw, you know, a transit Twitter account you know, publish something about an event as an image that had no alt text, right? So who are a group of those, the population that use transit a lot? It's blind people. And so if you're publishing your event information for your transit discussions or your transit actions as an image that doesn't have alt text, you're not including blind and low vision people in your conversation. Uh, and so as a baseline, I would say as a field, uh, you really have to work on uh, accessibility of your communications and your venues that you're having your meetings, the ways you're having your meetings, you know, the pandemic's still going on. Uh, I know I can't personally go to in-person stuff right now. So, you know, trying to do things hybrid. And when you make your communications uh, accessible and um, sort of extend the, the you know, uh, welcome mat that way, then what you can do is you can get a more diversely disabled population, you know, and that's diverse by a number of things because each each disability can be different. Even within a the same disability, it can be a little bit different. Then you have, you know, people who are marginalized in ways other than disability and you, their opinions and their experience, lived experiences are going to be different than mine would be. So. You don't want like a token representative of disability. You want as many different disabled people in your space as you can, because that's how you're going to get the answers of what's the best kind of like highest common denominator shared accessibility shared need that we have. There's a concept within the disability community of something called conflicting access needs. So, for instance, uh, I have uh, CPTSD, and because of my experience and how I got this, uh, one of the things that's a trigger for me is dogs. Um, and so, but at the same time, you know, there are people who need dogs for their disability. And so sometimes there's things where you have to work it out. You know, it's like I have to work it out with people because they can't, you know, I can't demand a dog free space because they need dogs in order to be able to, you know, meet their access needs. And so uh, there's that disability conflicting access needs. And then there is what we're talking here, which is that, you know, for some people the the design, you know, you're thinking, well, they don't need this because they've got this. And, you know, you have to work those things out. So the more diversely disabled 
your group is. And like the bottom line for that happening is communicating accessibly. And then, then you can add out outreach on top of that. And I'll shut up because there's not that much time. I mean, I think Megan, I, I agree with 100% with everything you said. I don't think there's really much to add to it. Um, I was just going to say that I think that if we're going to make locations harder to access because we're removing parking, that we really do need to take a closer look at the alternative options for folks to get to the locations where they need to go. Again, I mentioned the Maryland situation where the person who raised the concern just simply could not walk long distances. So there has to be some other way for folks to reach the destinations where they want to go. To add on to that, I think um, like the regional perspective too, um, with the alternatives to driving, because like living outside of Portland, like, you know, my mom and I go into Portland to access healthcare, you know, regularly. Um, and so I think too, like the context of, yeah, like the room, you know, lessening parking for a shopping center versus lessening parking for like the social services or something like that, or, you know, very different, um, situations. And so I think making sure that, like, because like, we don't like in like my mom's case, like, you know, like she like basically needs that door to door transportation. And so it's like, um, if we had alternatives to driving, um, out here, then we could, you know, take a bus into Portland or whatever. But, um, but because we don't have that, um, I don't know. I think that's where you get a lot of the like people from like outside of a city being like, you can't remove parking. I like to come into the city. And it's like, because they don't have an alternative way to get there. Yeah. This is honest and the building off what everyone just said. Um, I, you know, I think there's, there's this tension in the work that, that I do between sort of, the reality that we're in right now, which is a very auto-based, car-based, uh, you know, communities, right? <laughs> um, and then sort of what could be possible if this wasn't the way we organize things. Um, I, you know, it, and, and so recognizing that we're not at that other point yet. And like, you know, sure, there are many people who perhaps if they had an e-bike or uh, I have a friend with the same eye condition I do who uses a golf cart to get around with her family in, in Arizona. And I think that's awesome. Um, but like that works in certain contexts, not not everywhere. And she kind of does it because there's a lot of bike lanes in Tucson and then a lot of big parking checks that she can cut through to avoid the big arterials that she's not allowed to drive on. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, you know, there there could be a future that we could build towards where there are, are are alternatives to big vehicles being the way that you get from point A to point B, um, big privately owned vehicles. We're not there yet. And many of the, the solutions that are proposed by folks, whether that be, you know, uh, micro mobility solutions or ride share solutions, just haven't even considered or thought about or included people with uh, disabled people, right? <laughs> um in in the design of those so they just straight up don't work uh you think a lot about ride hail services that are wheelchair accessible and have no intention of being right so yeah <laughs> i'm just being really cognizant of that 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 there may be a different world that's possible but we're in, we won't we won't get there unless we actually bring people with with disabilities into the leadership and into decision making organizations so that it's not an afterthought or completely uh you know ignored when when we're planning uh planning things i'd also add that you know there uh the the folks here on the panel here today you know uh, i'm sure have existing efforts that they would welcome uh help pushing through you know and what i find again you know is when i see these conversations on twitter again that'll be this sort of like you know conversation above our head about disabled people but when with disabled people put forth this thing hey like saying hey I actually have this uh, action you could take. Could you please do it? People don't take that other step. So like, for instance, sort of the cat, there are a lot, of, a lot of ableist events that I experienced in my first quarter here as a grad student, but the catalyzing event was the lack of accessible cycle park. And the reason that ties in with a uh, reduction of auto parking is because there are disabled people who are capable of cycling, right? But if you build cycle racks that cannot accommodate the, that are not designed for 
the, uh, the kinds of cycles that disabled people tend to ride, then I can't. Then I have to get in my car. I eventually did get like I was hurt so much by these racks. My hands were hurt so badly that I couldn't do the work I was here to do. And for more than a year, I was having to take a car really just a mile or two because it was too far. I could not physically walk that far. And there was not a bus that came close enough for me to even get to the to walk to the bus stop to get there. So it forced me into my car. And me, you know, the uh, the U Univer University of California Transportation and Parking Services departments are funded by their auto parking. They're incentived. They're incentivized to create more auto parking because that's how they support their budget. And so they've, I was literally told when I fought for accessible parking, we need these inaccessible racks because they fit together so tightly that it saves us more space to make for auto parking. So this really is an issue that we need the help of the wider transit uh, community to push through. And unfortunately, it just, we don't see it. So, so, um, so I'm not saying this is the end and end all and be all of the conversation by any means. But there are connections here that I, I think people are not necessarily aware of, because as much as we need to uh, keep in mind the needs of, of folks with mobility and other needs who need to have disabled parking or need to have parking access, um, auto parking access, uh, you could also reduce the number of autos that are running around needing parking if only the cycle infrastructure were accessible. And this is on, you know, every UC, the, the, the racks differ by campus, but I can tell you, you know, UC Davis is famous for being this, you know, bike friendly campus. And almost every single rack on this campus is one that I would not be able to use. So that's an example of something you could make some big change there if we could get some people behind them. And those kinds of bike parking changes, would it also benefit? You know, people who are using increasingly cargo bikes or other mobility devices too. A lot. Uh, one thing I really come to appreciate much more is, you know, that so often we can make changes that are really just good for m many groups of people who are underserved by our status quo. Um, that benefit, you know, that that lead towards a more walkable, a more dense, you know, more sustainable type of of built environment. Um, you know, and and. So one, I want to shift for a second real quick, because I had an interesting conversation with Cassie yesterday about this. And, and like, I, I really, it's something I think probably our, the members listening would be pretty interested in is, is, you know, whether one way I had been thinking about this is, you know, like is, is there's, there is a lot of on-street parking and we talked a little bit about it, but, but the difference between, you know, usability from on-street parking or access from on-street parking versus off-street parking. How important is specifically off-street parking versus on-street parking? And like, you know, if, especially if you're in, they, like, can, you know, how how much of the demand, if let's say we just, you know, took all the parking on street and, you know, and had multiple, you know, spaces for people with disabilities that were reserved, um, you know, are there shortcomings? Are there, are there needs specifically for off-street built parking that that we need to account i can share more about yeah what we were talking about um with my experience so i think a lot of it does depend on what that street is like um because a lot of my experience with on street parking is honestly i it's rare for me to even find an accessible on street spot like when i see one i'm like whoa like it's like shocking to me because i rarely see them anywhere um or when I do see one, there's like one and you're like, I've, you know, no idea where the next nearest one would be. Um, but a, a big issue that I have um, as a driver is like, it takes me a while to get out of the car because driving really well, even though I can drive, um, it's, it'll never, like uh, driving a car will never be fully accessible to me. So I have a whole stool system for getting in and out of the car. And so it, it takes me a minute. And so if the parking spot is right next to um, a car, like a, like a, you know, traffic lane, if there's no like bike lane um, or, you know, if there's no sort of buffer at all, um, then it's like I'm just specifically thinking of I was parked in an accessible spot in downtown Oregon City, uh, which is very heavily dominated by large trucks driving around. 
And it was like pretty scary to get in and out of the car because I was like, I'm going to get run over just because it takes me a minute to get out. And then um, and then additionally, like getting my mobility device out of the car takes a while. And so it's like, I think it really depends the safety of the street, um, whether or not on street parking works and is actually accessible, because just because that was an accessible spot didn't mean it felt very safe to use for me. Um, yeah, and then I think we were also talking a bit about like the pricing of um, of like on and off street parking and stuff. And I think like with that, like to me, it just kind of, I don't know. To me, I just think about it like disabled people aren't a monolith. So like some people can afford to pay. Um, and so I feel like it should go more based on income than anything. But um, I don't know. My thoughts on that part are still evolving. And I guess from my perspective, we don't have a specific position at this point on on-street versus off-street parking, um, but I think it's very context sensitive. So it depends on what the community um, looks like and where the opportunities are to increase the um, accessibility for transportation options. But the other thing I was thinking of earlier, and maybe I should have mentioned it at, in a prior response to a question, is that I also would encourage us to look at these issues within the context of other livable communities types of issues. So one of the issue areas that AARP spends a lot of, has a history of engagement on is complete streets policy development. And I think this issue is an issue that would fit within those broader policy considerations when you're looking at the broader um, roadways that folks are looking to access by various means, whether it's by foot, by car, by mobility device, that the complete context of the street needs to consider the needs of all the users that potentially are going to use it. So um, again, I would encourage us to look at the other issue areas that are in play in our communities and states that we could be inserting this parking reform issue into and, and, and just getting more people um, involved and, and aware of these issues as well. If anyone else, I just want to give a space for if any, if there's any more comments on this. I just, you know, I, I, I would just say it, it can be really tricky. You know, I mean, I've seen things where from my experience, you know, I'm looking at like a redesign, you know, uh, somebody will propose, you know, a complete streets proposal, for instance, you know, where it looks reasonably decent to me. And then somebody who's, you know, uh, a, 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 takes bus and has a mobility disability, you know, points out like the, the something about the way that the bus stop part is designed usually having to do with, for instance, like having to cross into the bus stop over a cycle path where people are going to be, you know, zipping by. And I can see where, you know, suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, no, uh, that will that will be a problem. So, uh, again, it just, you know, outlines the importance of hearing as many different voices as possible, because, you you know, I, I tend to think of myself as somebody who's really looking out for things and I can still miss stuff, too. So, you know, it's just it's just good to have as much input as possible. Um, Katsu kind of brought this up, but I do want to spend at least a couple minutes talking about um, the the pricing and in particular how that impacts maybe um, access and and how it folds in how it plays in with um, disability placards and, and placard abuse. At our at our at our at our party in Los Angeles, uh, Professor Don Chu actually gave quite a long speech about um, disability placard abuse, which um, is, is, uh, in many states and many cities, uh, people with disability placard can park for free for unlimited amounts of time, um, on city streets. Like in California, the state cities are prohibited from charging or enforcing time limits on anyone with a disability placard. Um, and then he brought up some statistics such that, uh, one in eight California drivers has a disability placard that the verification process for di disability placard, um, uh, uh, uh Issuance is pretty lax. Um, that pe that cars featuring a disability placard um, are often parked seven times as long as another car. So there's a lot of like impact issues where you know we can have we can have as much disability parking as we as we you know you could paint it all blue, but if people are using that you know in a way if, 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 if the incentive is you have the blackbird not for access so much but for for saving money or time i think that that his position is that creates a large incentive for fraud um or people holding onto placards that or using them that aren't really issued to them or or maybe you know not considering the needs of others as much 
this kind of ties into just the idea of paying for parking and how that revenue is spent. And I, and I, I know it's kind of like a amorphous question, but I, 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 I'm curious if there are thoughts on, you know, like how impactful, like it is, how important is it to have deep discounts or free parking um, versus, you know, providing the accessibility of having spaces, you know, that might, you might have to pay for, but at least are available. Um, and thoughts about things, if you could pick, I will throw something fun up in there. Like if you could, this could potentially generate a lot of money if you're reducing disability plaque reviews, much more money can come through some of the revenue. So like, what would be a good thing the city could spend or a city could spend money on that it's not currently collecting that would help people with disabilities? This is a tough one because um, disabled people already undergo a lot of means testing and form filling and things like that. So uh, while, you know, you do have... In general, you know, and I had to come to this because, like everybody else, I was sort of raised in an ableist society and in a in an, in in some ways like in an authoritarian household where you sort of raised to think that you know people are less deserving; they have to prove they're deserving that kind of stuff. So it's something I've had to evolve out of. But you know, in general, you want accessibility to be uh, available, and like I don't care if other people use it, right? But with with parking, because of the way it is, it is rationed, right? And when you have a rationed accessibility, then you get into this point of like, how you know, the bureaucracy around rationing it and the rationales around rationing it. I can tell you that an awful lot of people uh, who are on SSI, SSDI, it's not enough to even rent a place by yourself with, okay? And for me personally, like, you know, I couldn't afford to have kids even if I wanted to. So I really can't share expenses with a larger family to, you know, have it. I, so, so, you know, not having to pay for parking definitely was helpful for me in trying to make ends meet in a system that was already, you know, I challenge anybody here to make it on $900 a month. And that's about what you're getting on SSDI. <laughs> and so... Uh, and, and then we have the additional problem that we have this massive housing problem, right? So there's a lot of disabled people on SSI, SSDI who end up having to live out of their cars. And so you can see why uh, they would, yeah, see, yeah, Cassie, yeah that's, it's even worse, you know. Um, you can see why uh, somebody who's having to live out of their car because it is that little money might need the free parking, right? And so, you know, I'd be inclined to let the person who doesn't need it get away with it if it's if it keeps that person safe. And then we have the additional thing that when we have any kind of, you know, bureaucracy around public space and cars, cops are involved. And when cops are involved, it's like, it's racist, you know what I mean? It's just it, the way it's carried out is racist. We haven't gotten where we... uh you know, a lot of people promised we were going to get in terms of defunding and abolition and things, you know, so you would not want the cops involved with with uh, with with going through that means testing and trying to say, you know, so. While definitely there is fraud that goes on and sometimes in some areas it's rampant and in Southern California, they caught, you know, somebody in the DMV down there kind of giving their friends, you know, placards away and stuff. Um. I, I think you would need to work with abolitionists to come up with a, a, a system that's completely outside of the cops and come up with something more just in terms of trying to see who needs it and who doesn't need it. But I think another way to go at it also is what you were suggesting before, which is that you can have fewer spaces, but have more of them be disabled parking spaces. And so that way, the people who don't even qualify for a disabled parking space you know, you're 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 sort of encouraging those folks to to take advantage of their alternatives. Yeah, I was surprised when you had shared that story with me when we talked before, because, um, yeah, like before that, I had really only ever heard of like disability placard fraud in the context of disabled people being falsely accused of it, um, especially people who don't use mobility aids being accused by non-disabled people or by disabled people who do use mobility aids as, hey, you're not disabled enough. Why are you using it? Um, and, you know, they just have some condition that you cannot tell just by looking at them. Um, and so, yeah, but I, yeah, definitely echo 
Megan's uh, concerns about like we already go through a lot of means testing and it can be pretty dehumanizing to like have like a non-disabled person determine whether you're disabled enough. And then it also like brings in the well, if you need a doctor's note, like equitable access to affordable health care, all of that. So um, brings in some bigger systemic issues. Uh, just to clarify, I think like the 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 type of fraud is not so much in people. Um, I, I I guess one of our discussions was that 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 you know by 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 removing the the incentive to get the free or long term parking out of having a disability placard, you would probably, you, you, the, the thesis is you would see less abuse of the placard because the main incentive is for the, is for the free parking. So it, uh, it might, it might reduce even scrutiny or, or, or just, you know, it's hopefully should increase availability, but I do, I, I take, um, I, I hear you and thank you for, for your viewpoints. So Anna's got a good point in the chat there. And then I guess I would also point out, you know, uh, again, for those of us who are, you know, terminally on Twitter, um, <laughs> we're probably familiar with the uh, the the accounts, you know, that focus on the amount of people, you know, who don't even have a placard, right, who are parking on the sidewalk, who are parking, blocking the bike lane, who are, you know. So I think it's a lot easier to focus on that sort of thing because, you know, in terms of just like stuff that's already, you, you know, again, you get into the enforcement issue again and you have to talk about that. But in terms of us societally, if we make it societally unacceptable, you know, if if every person that person encounters on their way to parking to that space is yelling at them and watching them and stuff like that, you know, we can create a lot of sort of peer pressure to, to, to just make it so that people aren't treating other people that way. But there are plenty of things like where we don't have to means test and we don't have to, um, you know, are you really disabled or whatever? Because there's already, you know, on, on the UC Davis campus, I see this all the time, you know, UC Davis trucks, will park far closer than any disabled space is to the building, uh, blocking the sidewalk and whatever. And nobody says boo to them about it, you know? So uh, there, there are things that we, you know, you could put pressure on the employer. You know, you have a, you have a, 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 a truck that has a brand name on it, right? And you can call them out and say, this is, you know, pay for your own parking, provide parking for your own, your own business. It's your business, right? Um, and then the other thing I would say is also design matters. So like uh, there was something I witnessed on campus here where, uh, and this is a new building, a new lot. They So this is like 32 years post ADA and they designed it like this. So uh, because they didn't design, or I, I, I hate to even make this excuse, but this is the excuse they would make. <laughs> we needed to use the disabled spot to to unload packages and and put this pallet in because we don't have a loading dock. <laughs> it's like, well, we're just letting the building. So sometimes you even have a disabled space, but people are misusing it because of terrible design and lack of involvement of disabled people in the first place. And this building wasn't designed after UC Access Now came out and called this stuff out. So like they they know, you know? There's so much to talk about, I had some other questions about, you know, balancing the housing and environment, which really I should have gotten to earlier, you know, like, how do we balance it? But I guess part of what I'm hearing, there's common theme here of, you know, like, I that I think Corlette brought it up, the complete streets, like, you know, our, our unsafe streets, our poor, you know, transit reliability, um, larger than um, fast vehicles driving down the streets, like, you know, when we talk about um, not, I think it was, Megan mentioned here, you can't remove the bridge without having another bridge to go. And and I, one of the tough things I, I feel about this issue is that the status quo and continuing to build the car, car centric infrastructure is really, it, it makes it almost impossible sometimes to record, means that for a generation, you're not going to have the type of infrastructure that provides the better access, the transit. You now, like the car infrastructure blocks the bike lanes box, the, which can be used for multiple mobility devices. It blocks the transit lanes. It blocks the kinds of sidewalks and access we need. So it's a, t it's a very tough balance that we're trying to, to navigate here. Um, I have to go in four minutes. So I want to end on one, like, just like on a scale of one to 10, how do you think the current status quo of our built environment serves people who you know, are aging or have disabilities? Like, you know, just a quick 
you know, one to 10, you can add a sentence in there. Um, and if you want to pitch your website or something, this would be a good time to do it because we'll, we'll wrap up after this, but um, we'll just go around and, and hot seat one to 10. How does the status quo serve folks? I'll start. I'll give it a five because I feel like there's a lot of it. There's obviously benefits to some people and there, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, so I'm going to say five. And I would encourage, again, folks to um, look at the resources I put in the, in the chat and visit AARP's Livable Communities page for more information. This is Anna. Um, for... <laughs> I don't know answer that question. I just want to throw out one other thing I just put in the chat. I think there's a lot of conversation going on around electric vehicle and then car charging right now and where those should be cited and how they should be cited and how charging can work in apartment complexes and my street where if you want to charge, you're dangling your extension cord across the sidewalk. And I can't tell you how many times I've worked on that, um, not being able to see it particularly well. And then, you know, how are these charging infrastructures being also made accessible to people with power wheelchairs who want to be able to go out and charge and e-bikes, um, you know. So just... I think that's that's for me a place that it feels like there could be a really positive conversation um, and a conversation that recognizes that there are many ways people go around. So that's that's something I focus on right now. Yeah, I don't know if I can successfully rate it. I think mainly because every disabled person's accessibility needs are different. So for some of the current system could be perfectly serving them. And for others, they could be stuck in their inaccessible house. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Excited to continue thinking about learning about these issues and um, advocating for better accessibility across all modes. And I'll put my Twitter in the, <laughs> in the chat because that's about all I've Anna, I'm going to be in touch with you because we are working on a, uh, we're working on this right now on some, some, I don't know, kind of like some best practices, suggestions on EV charging, which is parking, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, and I, and that uh, your input would be um, really helpful if, you're, if there's something you're already thinking about. Um, okay. Well, right on time. Um, let's get parkyreform.org. Uh, please, if you're interested in this, then you're not already a member, join, support us. Um, I'm going to follow up with these. Thank you so much um, to the panelists for giving us this time. Um, it's just, I think, really great. And I'm going to be in contact about trying to continue this conversation because I think it's it's one of the most important ones we can have on this. So um, thank you all. Thank thanks you for inviting us and thanks for bringing this together. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone.